Environmental Health Panel. Uh, on behalf of our team at Street Art Toronto, uh, who we will meet in a minute, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Catherine Campbell, uh, part of the Street Art Toronto team. And we believe as we do this work, we must first commit ourselves and continue on the path of reclamation, healing, and most especially truth. We make a commitment to being an ally, to ask questions, to listen and learn more, to admit and name our mistakes and learn from them, to understand our privilege, and to achieve the reconciliation that we all must help to achieve. Indigenous people are the original, foundational, fundamental parts of this land, and I am so proud and honored to be here. The land I'm standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. And I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Carolyn Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce Street Art Toronto to everyone. I think you might be somewhat familiar with us. We're an initiative of the City of Toronto Transportation Services Division, a suite of, we like to think, innovative city building programs, all of which are intentionally designed to showcase, celebrate, and support street, mural, and graffiti artists throughout Toronto. Start programs and projects are rooted in a set of values that demonstrate the positive and powerful impacts of diversity and inclusion, foster community engagement and civic pride, add color and vitality to neighborhoods, encourage active transportation, things like cycling and walking, showcase Toronto artists, including their ideas and beliefs, and contribute to their skills development, mentor emerging talent, and create opportunities for positive engagement among residents, business owners and operators, artists, and arts organizations. Today, Toronto is home to some of the best street, mural, and graffiti art and artists in the world. Street Art Toronto is committed to creating value with and for them from their entry onto the street art scene with access to small canvases and micro grants all the way up to large scale murals on multi-story buildings, skills building workshops, international artist exchanges, and more. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Michael Hutchinson. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Uh, my name is Michael Hutchinson and I'm a project lead with Street Art Toronto. And I have the pleasure of introducing Muse Arts and talking a little bit about our partnership with them over the last few years. So a little bit about MuseArts. So working with community partners, MuseArts create spaces for emerging artists from equity-seeking groups to showcase their work, to access opportunities for professional development, and to engage communities meaningfully and actively in hands-on high-quality arts education integrated in issues of social justice. In 2020, MuseArts partnered with Street Art Toronto as part of the Street Art Toronto Partnership Program to create a project which celebrated the 100th anniversary of Pearl's Court Park. The community mural was painted by Alex Usquiano and assisted by a group of local artists in a design created with neighborhood participation. We're honored to continue to work with MuseArts and look forward uh, to the conversation today. Uh, and with that being said, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jason Campbell. Many thanks, Michael, and uh, to the rest of the Street Art team. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Campbell, and I'm a project lead with the Street Art Toronto team. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our facilitator into today's space for the workshop, Paola Gomez. Paola is a trained human rights lawyer, community organizer, public speaker, community artist, and a writer. A member of PEN, Canada's Risen Exile, and an advocate, Paola is involved in causes such as ending violence against women and forced migration. Paola is the co-founder and director of Muse Arts and the creator, director, and producer of Happening Cultural Festival. Paola's work with refugee and newcomer communities 
have been greatly recognized in Canada, where she arrived as a refugee. Paola's community art focuses on community and peace building. Paola is currently a professor at Centennial College and the 2021 Toronto Public Library Entrepreneur in Residence. Without further ado, I will now pass the screen over to our facilitator, Paola Gomez. Thank you, Jason, for the introduction and welcome everyone who's tuning in. I am thrilled and I feel absolutely honored to be here this afternoon to listen, learn and engage in experience engage in a process of knowledge and experience sharing. I am looking forward to this conversation because we will have the opportunity to hear from the experiences and the wise practices of three very talented and very well-known artists and community organizers and activists in our communities. But before we open the conversation, welcome our speakers to share their art and their perspectives on the intersection of artivism. Listen, I'm calling it artivism, art and activism. In mental health, I would like to take a moment to express deep gratitude to the Street Art Toronto and the Muse Art teams for putting this event together, as well to welcome and to recognize the important work that our ASL interpreters are doing this afternoon. Uh, our interpreters are Brittany and Kel, and they're making sure that this conversation is reaching to as many members of the community as possible. I also would like to remind you that this event is being live streamed to MuseArt's Facebook page, and that later on, and it's being recorded, and later on is going to appear on YouTube, uh, on YouTube through MuseArt's channel. We are extremely lucky and, and I feel excitement and a great sense of gratitude as well, because we have three very powerful, the energy that they have is so great, artists, community organizers, activists, cultural producers, to talk about something that is very relevant and always so much needed, which is the intersection between art activism and mental health. This is such a big topic because it touches the personal, the relational, the social and the political. And while it is absolutely true that the community organizing work brings so much reward, it, also, it is also very taxing. And I believe that is extremely important and only relevant that having the wise panelists that we have today, we open this space to the richness of the conversation and we allow that conversation to take us wherever it needs to take us. <laughs> and I also would like to share with you how this uh, panel, this conversation is going um, to take place. Initially, we will have uh, each panelist to share with us um, their work, as well as to let us know or to express how community organizing and social justice uh, influence their work. Then uh, we will take some time for each panelist to react to the proposed question, the intersection of art, activism, and mental health. Later on, we will open the conversation among ourselves based on the initial responses and some questions that I had prepared and that I'm, I'm very curious in hearing each of the panelists' responses. I know that this is sounding as, as I have a big amount of questions, but trust me, the conversation is gonna go really, really, really fast because this is such an important topic. At about 3 p.m., we will take questions uh, and the panel will answer them. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the run of the panel. We have uh, two uh, members, two team members of Muse Arts uh, taking the questions through the live stream and to our uh, Zoom meeting. So we are sure to gather all of them and answer as much as possible. And without any further ado, let's start. I am going to start by introducing Chafia Chaik. 
and I want to wait until we have the image of uh, her work, I think first her, her, her picture, but you will see her. Chafia Chaik is a visual artist and a community organizer. Her work strives to bring awareness to the lived experiences of people of color as means to contribute to change. She's also the co-founder uh, of the EWOC project, Equity for Women of Color an initiative committed to creating art that highlights the complex realities and narratives of women of color and their intersecting identities. As means to defy prejudice against gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, ability, and identity. I would like to invite Chafia to join us and to share with us their her views and her talk on how community organizing and social justice influence your work. Once again, thank you very much for being here and we're looking forward to learning with you and from you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I also just wanted to start off by saying how uh, incredibly fortunate I am to have the timing of this workshop or this panel happen uh, because I think this is something that's been on a lot of our minds, our well-being and mental health, uh, just given all that we've experienced in 2020. So I just, I think the timing of this is perfect and I'm sure it's something a lot of people can relate to and are feeling right now. Um, so thank you to Street Art Toronto and News Arts for putting something like this together and thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Shafia, I'm a community artist, and I do equity-based work that takes forms of public art projects, youth workshops, and street art. And I do that work under the name The Ewok Project, which, um, as Paola mentioned earlier, is an acronym for Equity for Women of Color. And uh, a lot of my work actually centers around programming in Scarborough, because that is where I'm from and that is where my heart will forever be. Uh, but a lot of my public artwork has expanded much further than that and has taken parts in other or taking part in other communities as well and all across Toronto and um, when I first started out I kind of thought that my work would only relate to street art and I took the mural art career development program that takes place at mural roots in Scarborough and I really thought that my work would just start and end with just street art and not really expand past that and when I started to uh, look for opportunities in street art and I was looking for people who kind of look like me that were racialized people that were women or women identifying um, I couldn't really find anyone and I really thought that I would just add to myself to a, a collective or to a group of women that were already doing similar work and just participate in that way. I didn't really see myself being the person to put together an initiative at all, but um, once I kind of noticed that there isn't really anyone I can connect with, uh, I knew that I had to work in a way that actively addressed that gap. And that's how I kind of started doing work under the Ewok project. And it started off very small in the form of um, bell box murals or outside the box murals. And then gradually I went more into laneway projects. Um, and even then laneway projects where it's an entire massive laneway with multiple artists uh, painting together you could see the racialized people there there were few and far between um, it was just it was a very jarring experience for me and so later as I got more funding in the form of micro grants which is how I actually got my start and I was able to create projects on my own terms and I made sure that the artists that I collaborated with and the artists that were emerging uh, who didn't really have the opportunities were women of color were women identifying were racialized um, and basically provide spaces and opportunities and those building block experiences for them to grow as emerging artists and um, I really wanted that to be the focus of all the projects that I take on and eventually I was uh, I kind of gradually found my way into public art projects and one of the highlights of my life so far has been uh, being able to do an art installation for Nuit Blanche in 2019 and that was a uh, live painting installation and it was participatory so a lot of the uh, the audience could actually paint with us in certain moments, but all of the artists that uh, that participated in that were either Indigenous, were Black, or women of color, and I was just so happy to be able to do a project to that scale and provide that space and that platform for up-and-coming artists and artists who may not have that opportunity to kind of um, 
get more experience and have more eyes on them. And that was something that I actually noticed in street art myself as well, that a lot of times when you start to do work and you want to be a, a, a working artist and into street art, you really have to apply showing past work. And it's kind of this loop that we find ourselves in sometimes where if you are never afforded the opportunity, you can't create the work. And if you don't have the work, you can't apply for these opportunities. Um, and that was a huge barrier. So I really wanted the artists that we take on to be those artists that needed that stepping stone to gain that experience and hopefully go on from there. Um, and then later I kind of transitioned into youth workshops as well and that was quite a personal journey for myself and growing up I didn't really find a lot of uh, programming that was inclusive and for Muslim women of color and I really wanted to make sure that the specifically in Scarborough that I was providing programming for my community and that it was inclusive and gave them a space where they got to explore their identity in in depth and relate with other young women of color who are also Muslim or Muslim identifying and learn about different art practices and um, the intention behind creating a space where we could talk about the, the barriers and the, the realities of their lives and then also look into how Black Muslims are not experiencing the world the way the rest of us, the, the other Muslims are, queer Muslims are not experiencing the world the way other Muslims are and kind of have that space for them to think and um, connect with each other as well as gain resources to work in the arts um, and navigate that landscape effectively. And I think having that programming as youth really gives you the foundation and the support that I wasn't really able to get um, so yeah, I think I, I've kind of transitioned my career into a variety of different fields, but the common thread between them all truly is um, looking through the world with a lens of equity and trying to provide spaces for people that they otherwise would not have and trying to um, basically make it easier for the next generation of artists to come up and find it easier for them to connect with themselves. Shafia, thank you very much for sharing your experience, but also your journey. Quite a journey and also very empowering. I absolutely feel very connected in a lot of uh, the aspects that you uh, mentioned resonated uh, with me as well. I think it's very powerful and I'm looking forward to our conversation in, in, in further exploring how uh, this journey was also, um, the intersectionality with mental health was also part of this journey. So now I would like to introduce our second uh, panelist. And it is always my pleasure to introduce to you Cyrus Marcus Ware. He's a veneer scholar, a visual artist, a community activist, a researcher, youth advocate, and educator. Cyrus uses painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks in Black activist culture. His work has been shown in galleries and festivals across Canada. Cyrus is the courting member of Black Lives Matter Toronto and part of the Performance Disability Collective. Please, Join me in welcome Cyrus to share with us his, um, you know, how is it that community organizing and um, social justice influence your work? Once again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much uh, for having me uh, here today. Uh, I <clears throat> just want to say I'm coming to you from the part of Tuckeronto that was underwater at the time of the Toronto Purchase and is the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Three Fires Territory and territory covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum. It's an honor to come to you from these territories. So my work is largely guided by this idea that comes from Tony Capembera, who said in the 1980s that uh, the role of the artist from the oppressed or marginalized community or communities uh, was to make the revolution irresistible, to, to make the revolution irresistible. So my practice has largely been rooted in this idea of trying to make the revolution seem possible, seem um, doable, seem um, 
eminently, uh, you know, just around the corner um, <clears throat> for us to believe that we can uh, do this, that we can change the world. So I've been uh, creating, uh, I've also been involved in direct action and organizing on the front line. So both as an artist and an, and an activist, both for about 25 years. So my practice has interspersed and interconnected with my activism and my activism has been informed by my artistic practice all the way along. I'll show you two quick projects that uh, kind of illustrate how I bring art and activism together. The first is the activist portrait series that I've been drawing since 2014. Um, for this series, I've been drawing larger than life uh, portraits of activists, interviewing them about um, their organizing, about time travel, if they could travel to any point in human history and get involved in a social movement, where would they go and why? And then about love, um, and I take photographs of them while they're uh, answering these questions, and then I draw them. And this shows you kind of for scale, this is Queen Titi Obelecki. Uh, standing in front of her portrait, just to kind of give you a sense of how big these are. They're about 12 feet tall. Um, and yeah, they're just these acts of reverence, acts of celebration, uh, ways of kind of showing Black joy, Black queer joy, Black crypt joy, um, ways of, of documenting and archiving what activism is looking like in, in Black communities in this north part of Turtle Island and in Uninigit. Um, and and yeah, these opportunities to sort of tell a story about activist lives, making people interested in wanting to get to know these people more. Like, you know, wouldn't you just want to start talking to Troy here, sitting with his plaid suit, just ready to have this conversation, you know, or be engaged in this conversation that Dainty Smith and Keisha Williams are having, um, where Dainty's clearly in the middle of a yarn telling a story. And it makes you kind of want to get to, you know, it, it makes activism legible. These are human beings who are working to change the world so we can figure out ways together how to support them in doing this work. Um, I'm really interested in <clears throat> speculative fiction and this idea that uh, we, you know, Alida Imarisha talks about um, in Octavia's Brood, she, she writes that all activism is speculative fiction because we're daring to dream that another world is possible. It's so nice, right? All activism is speculative fiction because we're daring to dream that another world is possible. So I have been doing a lot of speculative fiction works that uh, help us to imagine the world that we're working towards, this post-revolutionary world that we're trying to get to. <clears throat> so one of the new projects that I've done is this project called Emmet that is a play that was commissioned by Obsidian Theatre and CBC Gem um, and that started airing last week. <clears throat> on Friday on CBC Gem and will be up for a year. I worked with director Tana Tate and actor Prince and Pansa and told the story of, um, of a disabled future, of a future world where Medgar uh, <clears throat> lives on the edge of the great Ontario Sea, a newly formed waterway caused by climate change when the Humber River flooded with, uh, meets with the dawn and floods with Lake Ontario and you know, creates this massive waterway that stretches as far east as the St. Lawrence River. And we meet Medgar living there on the edge of the shore in a world that is gripped by viruses where <clears throat> a large virus uh, pandemic called the fall uh, that happened seven years earlier has wiped out the majority of the Earth's population. And those that are left are sort of scattered around the globe. And he is uh, living uh, on this shoreline um, in what was once Tecoronto. And he uh, is marveling on the fact that he survived. So in the, in, against all odds and in the most unlikely of ways, he says he survived the fall. Uh, and it talks about, uh, yeah, this queer disabled future where uh, we kind of get to imagine a world where uh, Medgar Evers and Emmett Till are reimagined in a future. And in this future, they're beloved. And it's about what happens to them. In particular, what happens to Medgar on this particular day when everything changes. So I'll just play a really quick uh, clip and then I'll end there. It's been seven years exactly since the fall. I normally spend today remembering the past, honoring our dead, and marveling that I somehow survived. I do it alone, you know. It feels private somehow. I mean, I guess we do everything alone now. I like to light candles. 
I normally do the same things on this day as I remember. But this year, everything is different. Today is not about the past. It's about the future. So this play is uh, filmed as a filmed theatrical production and yeah, it imagines these activists re, re, you know, living a new life in the future as Stardust, as Beloveds. Um, and it'll be airing for a year on CBC Gem and you can take a look at it there. I'll end there. Thank you so much. Cyrus, thank you very much for sharing your work and, and the inspiration that comes with it. It is absolutely uh, breathtaking and, and I really love the, the concept to dare to dream. I, I just love that concept and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank Me you. Me too. Me too. Thank you. We are going to, we're going to um, invite our third panelist and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Joel White Dog. He's an Ashnobi in Algo King. He was born in Norway, Ontario from the Mink clan. Joel is the founder of the Ring Fire Productions in the honor of Nish Ditch, my Katerian Catering. He's a public speaker, a chef, a teacher, and he focuses in topics related to indigenous food sovereignty, language and cultural revitalization, advocacy, and urban indigenous visibility. Through this, he had done multiple partnerships where he had curated a series of murals painted by indigenous artists. Joel, you are, you know, we, it is an honor for us that you're here into this space with us and we definitely are looking forward to hear your answer to the question of what and how community organizing and social justice influence your work and you do a lot of things we definitely are looking forward to hear the influence of oh chi miigwech uh, ani and Kwe Kwe to everyone. Hello, my name is Chef Joel White Duck Ringet, and what a what a pleasure and what an honor to be here today, uh, Shavia and Cyrus. My goodness, that incredible time to see your work and be able to be on this panel with you. So thank you, Street Art, and thank you, Muse, for having me here. Chimi I'm going to just start with uh, uh, the very basic time um, in my life of learning, which was some 25 years ago. Um, the act of smudging. And so if I can just show you what I'm doing, many of you know what I'm doing. This is an ancient practice of our indigenous, many indigenous nations. I'm lighting a sacred plant called sage. Um, in English, it's called sage. And in my language, Anishinaabe Moan, it's called Mashkadoesk. And what I'm doing is I'm going to smudge with this. And the smudging process is to waft that beautiful sacred smoke over you. And it's so that I'm bringing the best possibility of myself to you right now. And that is the very first act I do with trying to keep uh, my spirit healthy and my mental health, my emotional health, my physical health, all things included with the um, act of smudging. And what it does is uh, it promotes the way that I'm going to look at the world, the way the world's going to look at me, the way I'm going to hear the world the way I'm gonna listen and the way I'm gonna speak and the way I'm going to feel and experience the world. So each day I wanna do that to really ground myself. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that with all of you today. Um, it is in my journey about uh, in 2005 when I uh, was told through one of my teachers, his name is Mark Thompson, he was a healer and a medicine man who worked at Anishinaabe Health Toronto. Um, I had been attending Anishinaabe Health Toronto for several years at that point. And I had a traditional teacher who was guiding me through the process of learning my identity. Because um, as uh, many of you may know or may not know, indigenous people have been greatly dislocated from their culture for all kinds of way through government policy of the Indian Act, which still exists to this day. And of course, the um, ongoing legacy of the residential school 
the impact of the trauma of the residential school legacy and uh, the 60s scoop, the 70s scoop, and all the different means that have happened historically to suppress and make indigenous people invisible and, and basically destroy culture and the people themselves. So the act of sharing with you Smudging is the very most important thing I can do as an Indigenous person to tell you that I've reclaimed that spiritual uh, affirmation in my life to be able to take the plant that Gitche Manitou or Creator or God uh, gave to the Anishinaabe and Indigenous people. And these plants exist and this act exists all over the world with all Indigenous people nationwide. And that's that's the the love that I, I love I have in my life to share with you that everybody has indigenous ancestors. Every single person has indigenous ancestors. And in this case, mine are the Anishinaabe people or known as Ojibwe people and the Algonquin people. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what I've been doing uh, with the gift that Mark Thompson, that medicine man told me about. So I was working in uh, indigenous justice for almost a decade. It was a really difficult time. As you know, the, the uh, misrepresentation as they call it, or just the over representation of indigenous people and people of color inside our Canada's institutions um, that are incarcerated is astronomical. And it has been for many, many generations. Uh, so for a long time, Canada is being uh, greatly pressured by the United Nations to look at what it can do to amend the situation of Indigenous people who are in custody. And eventually they came out with something called the Principles of GLADU. GLADU really in short is, a, is a, an act within the criminal code that says if you're Indigenous and you know about these principles, you can get your counsel to look at them and, and utilize them to try and get the court system to review your entire history as an Indigenous person and look at the barriers and the uh, incredibly ineffable trauma that you have faced as an Indigenous person and how it led to your in continued incarceration or your continued, in many cases, institutionalization of our people. So while working in that system, I really knew I needed spiritual guidance and I needed a lot of mental health support. It was a very, very difficult time in my life and continues to be to think about all the many thousands upon thousands of indigenous people and people of color who are in custody to this day uh, for no really important reasons that, that, that we need to discuss and have to change in our systems. And systems can be changed. And that's part of what I hope we're all sharing today that our activism within the world brings that sense of hope that as a united people, we can make changes in the world. And in this case, I've done it through going back to find out who am I as an indigenous person. And it was in that act of meeting Mark Thompson and hearing that he told me that at some point very soon, I would pass over my tools as a GLADU aftercare worker, as an injust, you know, ind indigenous justice worker, pass those tools over to someone else and take up my true life's work, which was to bring back the Anishinaabe diet to the people. And that has a really exciting and surprising thing to find out. Um, although I worked in the food in industry since I was 15 years old, I hadn't ever shared that with Mark. I'd only gone to him because of my work in, 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 in indigenous uh, justice system. And so when I found that out, I really didn't know where to start, but I followed his guiding principles. And I will tell you that to this day, it was certainly the best blessing or gift I could have ever been given because this is my life's work I'm bringing to you and continue to learn about indigenous food sovereignty for the rest of my life. And where that's led me is to find out about the plants. So yes, I'm an indigenous chef. I have gone all over the nation trying to find out what were our former uh, food systems before colonizers came here or new people came here and changed those systems through all kinds of various means, some intentional and some unintentional. And uh, what I found is, is in incredibly engaging, incredibly exciting, and also um, a very difficult thing because some of it's so inaccessible now, but some of it again is right here in your backyard. So really bringing back our focus to food systems, of course, 
during the pandemic, so many people have really become food focused and that's so important at this time. So what I, what I like to bring through my activism is indigenous food sovereignty. Of course, we've created a couple not-for-profits through Nish Dish. And how we've done that is we use Nish Dish as an educational hub to call the community to. At this time, Nish Dish has been closed due to COVID but we do have a contingency plan and we love to share that. If you're ever interested, please go to GoFundMe and look at our contingency plan of Nish Dish. And if there's any way you can help, even just spreading the word, sharing the link, we love for that to happen because I am going to come back. I'm not gonna be able to come back as a restaurant, but I'm coming back as a marketeeria, which was always part of my uh, social enterprise anyway, which was the Marketeria, which is an indigenous food shop. So I'm looking to do that. And with a lot of community support, there's no reason why I cannot do that. And I will do that. Um, the other thing that I'm sharing with you are the two not-for-profits. One of them, of course, is called TIBA, uh, Toronto Indigenous Business Association. So a whole pile of indigenous social entrepreneurs have gotten together. There's actually 13 of us at the core that run the membership. We do it through the, the uh, spiritual guidance of an elders council. So we have an elder present who opens all the meetings and this has prevented all kinds of lateral violence that can often take place when you've got so many ambitious people who have all kinds of different ideas. So it's been a really successful group of entrepreneurs who have come together to look at ways that we can build a community hub for Indigenous people. And one of our focuses on that has been at the Bickford Centre. So if you know where the Bickford Centre is, you know that it's this giant fantastical building that sits between two green spaces of the quarter um, of Garrison Creek. So you're looking at Christie Pit, that's the green space I'm talking about, and then Bickford Park. And it sits right there at 77 Bloor West, uh, Bloor Street West. And there we've created, through the help of street art, uh, 17 different indigenous murals. They are massive. They are all indigenous ancestral teachings. They are connected to the land, to the plant and animal clan system, and to our responsibilities as human beings are two leggeds that have a responsibility to the land and to the plants and a reciprocal relationship with the planet that we live on. And it's a real pleasure today to talk to you about uh, many of those plants, and we'll have an opportunity to get to those later. Um, the other not-for-profit I was going to speak about quickly is called Ojibikan Indigenous Cultural Network. And Ojibikan means roots in our language. So our roots, of course, are really important. And as you go back to many of us who have been dislocated from our culture or our nations, we find out what our roots are. And this is an incredible act of reclamation to actually find out what is my identity? Because many of us come from so many different places. I myself come from the North. Uh, I'm originally born in North Bay, Ontario and lived outside of that city for the first decade of my life. And uh, my mother's people are from Nipissing, Nipissing Nation, Nipissing First Nations. And so that's the extent of what I knew growing up. It wasn't until I came to this very, very large city that I began to find an indigenous a community here and find traditional teachers who could actually bring me back to the culture and begin to share with me what it actually means, what our practices were, what our practices are, and how I could embrace them in my life and learn about what my identity as an Anishinaabe person is. So with that, um, I can share a bit about Ojibakan Indigenous Cultural Network. It is doing um, what I talked about earlier, which is these urban gardens. So the urban gardens are done through indigenous agroecology. So we're essentially bringing all people back um, in the forelight and priority of that as indigenous people so we can relearn our ceremonies that we always had with the plants, our way of communicating with the plants and how we work the land in the very specific ways to share the, our responsibility to the soil. So that was, that's the main thing about indigenous agroecology. There are specific plants that are grown together through ceremony and making sure that that... Thank you so much for having an opportunity to just uh, share a bit about those not-for-profits that we created through um, Nish Dish and uh, Red Urban Nations Artists Collective, which is how those murals were done. I don't think I mentioned their name before. Chimigwech. Thank you very much, Chef Joel, for sharing your journey. 
but also I, you know, in a very personal note, I, I want to express my gratitude because you are lifting my spirit as well. Um, it, this part of how our, our ancestry is being erased is part of the realities of many of my brothers and sisters and myself back in the territory that we know as Colombia. So I definitely, this, this resonates so much with me. And while I'm hearing and, and taking all the beauty and the wisdom that you all have shared with, with us, I cannot wait to, to have very specific words that are kind of like jumping in my, in my, in my head right now. And one is community. And the other one is identity, how our identities also inform these journeys that we undertake where we recognize injustice, where we recognize and experience and experience it as well and, and try to and, and dare to dream of a, of a different world, just as, as Cyrus had mentioned before. Um, the, the aspects that Shafia was referring to are also very close because uh, as, a, as a woman of color myself, I, I do know the, the, the lack of those spaces. So I am absolutely thrilled to be able to, to continue this conversation with the three of you. And, and something that I want to say before we, we continue is that I have, you know, I have my email. It's like, I have a lot of emails right now. People from Ottawa, from Halifax, make, asking me to make sure that we are recording this because they are not gonna be able to stay for the entire event, but they want to, uh, to be able to, to hear and to, and to witness uh, the wisdom and the sharing that is happening into this space. And I want to say, yes, we are recording and you will have this on YouTube uh, later in the week. So I would like to invite the three panelists to, to come onto the screen. So we start a conversation and we, we start getting your reactions to the proposed intersection of art, activism, and mental health. You know, from the individual, interrelational, social, and political. So, of course, I'm asking uh, again if you all can join in, Achavia, um, Cyrus, and Joel, if you can join uh, the screen to to share with us your initial, you know, your initial responses to to this intersection. And um, of course, you know, whoever wants to start. So, what are your initial reactions to that intersection that I'm proposing? And also, you know, I'm just going to ask a question out of my own curiosity: How you feel with the term activism? I use it a lot. I love it. So how you feel about it? And, and, and again, the intersection between activism and mental health. Yeah, I guess I can start. Um, I actually have not heard art, artivism before this, uh, but I love a good portmanteau, so I'm, I'm all about it. Um, but I, I do see like the intersections of that being um, the only way to really look at the world for myself, um, because even the way that I uh, started working in the arts was through activism and that naturally just paired with mental health even though I wasn't consciously thinking about it that way just they just go so much hand in hand and I, I think it's just such a tricky thing to navigate because when you are passionate about something and it is so personal and it deeply affects your life the people you love the tendency to give it your all is so natural and um, that is not at all sustainable so it, it is something that I think we all battle to some extent is like the work that you care about is so important, is so crucial um, to try and balance that with also taking time to check in with yourself and your own well-being and how not only what you're doing, but how is that affecting you? How, how are you um, how, what are the impacts of that on your day to day on your on your well-being? Um, that's definitely something that is difficult to navigate. And I think I'm still kind of learning that on my own. Um, but yeah, it's like an ongoing process, but definitely something that goes hand in hand and is so important. <clears throat> yeah, I can uh, again, and I will say that, you know, you know, I'm a mad disabled artist and, um, for me, madness has informed a lot of my artistic practice. You know, the way that I work, the way that um, 
the, the kinds of stories that I tell, who the characters are in these stories that I create when I'm doing performances. Um, a lot of my early performance artwork was exploring uh, my experience of being a sex survivor and what that, but but in a sort of humorous way. And it was like um, telling funny stories about my experiences. And that's how I started doing performance art initially. So to me, they've always, it's always been a part of my practice, you know, is sort of thinking through um, what it means to be a mad person creating work uh, in this world that is, you know, really sameness, you know, and uh, so I've been really interested in that. And I think that, again, in this idea of making sort of irresistible revolutions, we're sort of working towards a world where mad people will get to be free, where we will get to be uh, considered inherently valuable and not a problem, you know? So uh, I'm really working towards that world and my artistic practice helps to do that, you know? So absolutely, I guess that is artivism, right? Is, you know, this way of using artistic practice to push for change. So I tell stories where there are disabled and mad heroes, you know, where they are leading us through something, where they are the future, where they are the ones that survive, where they are the ones that uh, that help us get to where we're trying to get to. Um, and that's part of my activism to, to sort of support us as mad people, you know, because I think otherwise uh, there are so many ways that the society really um, marginalizes and, and puts so much shame and stigma on so-called mental, mental illness, you know, that it makes it that we can't be out about our, our stories and we can't talk also about the, the joy that we also have um, with the ways that our brains think differently and you know that it doesn't always have to be about how hard things are. So I'm just here to kind of big up and support mad people. Uh, I, I like to do that through my practice and um, I think I hope it makes uh, a more accepting world for mad people in the future. Uh, um, oh, um, I think, I mean, I have the opportunity because of the urban gardens to participate in them. Um, I can't do a lot of heavy work because uh, I was uh, hit by a TTC bus on my bike in 2013 and I've sustained a brain injury and all kinds of ineffable issues that I can't really go into right now. But what I want to talk about is the healing properties of plants. So this plant right here is called Scouring Rush. This is one of our oldest plants that were given to us by Creator. Of course, the first one that we talk about is Asema, which is a tobacco. Uh, if you pick plants ever, if you garden, um, one of the practices of Indigenous people, it's very important to talk about and acknowledge and actually create this act is to take that sema, that tobacco and pray into it and put it down on the land before you take a plant or take something for yourself. You're giving it back to mother earth and you're thanking them for that. So this plant is called scouring rush. And what it does is it's a connector healing plant of your bones. You can see it up close. It has these little ridges in it and it's long and people know this as horse hair or sorry, horse tail. And there's two different types of horsetail. This is the one you want. You see that there's no spindly uh, cones on this. Uh, it's just a straight green plant. And if you dissect this, you do a cross section of this plant, it looks exactly like the human bone. So you make a tea from this. Just very quickly boil water. Do not boil the plant. Steep the plant, break it up, put it in there, and let it ste steep for as long as you can, for a long time, and you drink that, there's no contraindications, cannot get sick from this plant. Uh, indigenous people have drank this plant for thousands of years. We just didn't know about it recently. We forgot about it because a lot of these plants were called weeds and destroyed. This is a savior of, of uh, bone health. It helps bone health and all the connecting tissue. That's what these little connectors are. They're showing us that that's just like our joints in our body. And we look for this plant, we call to this plant and we communicate with this plant to find it in the woods. And the plant leads us to it. And then we make tea with it. And that's one of the ways that we heal our body. So in my case, I get to go into those gardens I've talked about, which you're welcome to come to as the growing season starts. The planting will start in May and will convene through uh, different parts of the growing season. 
Ojipakan has four gardens, three of them are in the city, and Minikan, which is my personal gardening business that I co-founded, also has a garden down at the Bickford Centre that you're all welcome to come to and learn about Indigenous agroecology. Chi miigwech. Thank you very much. I will definitely be going to the garden and, and it just reminds me of the many of the many ways in which um, my grandma, my abuelita, will actually go to that memory and what her ancestors had, had taught her to, to also be able to, to work and exist in the communities that had insistently wanted to erase her, right? And erase who she, who she was. So thank you for sharing all that. And when I'm hearing, I am hearing a lot of messages of hope, you know, a lot of messages of joy. And I want to ask, to the panelists and whoever wants to answer again, how this, you know, these feelings, because we also may be survivors of, or, of trauma. You know, we are, we are dealing with all these feelings where we are not able to trust. You know, we have our closest communities where, where we do the work and we, where we feel connected, but we also are surrounded with so much uh, injustice, you know, and we, and I'm talking from the personal experience, we work in one issue and 10 issues more will appear and, and you want to remain hopeful and you want to remain joyful, but even at the moment of you feeling the joy, there is also a sense for me of guilt because I still know that there is so much pain out there that for some reason I'm not able to, to alleviate for others, you know, and so, so then I would like to to hear your 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 thoughts on that. You know, at this uh, struggle with trusting when these systems had hurt us so much, and so how we create change in 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 the systems where we live, where we know that the systems are already corrupted as they are. Anybody would like to answer to that or to just give feedback into what I'm saying? Thank you. <laughs> I mean, one thing I would say is <clears throat> our system more broadly is going through a period of dramatic systems change and systems collapse, right? So <clears throat> there's this panarchy cycle that was first articulated in the 1800s, but it sort of describes how systems have a life cycle, how they go through periods of growth and expansion, but then they also go through periods of collapse and reorganization, and that that's just part of the natural life cycle of a system, so much like plants and animals and other organisms, systems also have these life cycles. And so our system is going through a shift right now. We're definitely in a period of both collapse, but also reorganization, as in we're planting seeds and, and watering uh, for new ways of being together in the future. We're, we're, we're starting to build these abolitionist communities. We're starting to you know, do these this work around land back and indigenous resurgence. We're, we're, we're doing work to support black uh, you know, lives matter. We're doing all of this work to kind of plant the seeds for the future that we wanna live in um, as a way of kind of building these, these potential futures. Um, so the system change that is happening is sort of a guarantee, like the, the system is going to change. Um, uh, the system will change, it's changed before and it will change again. Uh, what we need to do now is we need to do what Octavia Butler encouraged us to do, which was to touch the change, to shape the change, to make sure that the system changes in a way that benefits the, the majority of us, you know, to make sure that those of us who have been on the margins, um, you know, have what we need to survive and thrive in this world that we're creating. Um, so I guess I would say, you know, to me, that is, that is actually hope to hold on to. Uh, studying systems theory and systems thinking has helped me to understand that all cycles live and die. You know, all cycles go through uh, periods of growth and collapse. Um, and that that allows us to know what, you know, knowing where we're at in that cycle allows us to know what pressures to put on what parts of the system to try to make structural change happen. You know, I think what we're looking for here when we talk about abolition is actually a complete 
revolution, you know, a revolution of our society. We want to return to old ways. We want to imagine future new ways. We want to, you know, learn from indigenous knowledge. We want to root our work in black, black affirming space. We want to build accessible futures. We want, we want to completely reimagine this world, which will mean structural change. And we're already in a period of systems collapse. This is the moment when we can plant the seeds for the structural change that we want to see. Um, so I'm I'm just here for it. I'm ready. You know, change is coming. Change is here. It is happening. The world is changing every day. Uh, we're in this pandemic. It's I mean, everything is up in the air right now. Now is the moment to get involved. Now is the moment to touch change. I just wanted to say that that was such a beautiful way of phrasing it and just such a hopeful response. Um, and I think for, for myself, I, I definitely used to think of this whole situation as the way to work towards change is for, for me to just not stop and just keep pushing, keep pushing and keep working and say yes to everything, regardless of what it takes for me, just take advantage of as many op opportunities as possible. And I think I fed into this perception and this fallacy of, of scarcity in opportunities. And I think that type of thinking is truly poisonous for, for your well-being. And it's also the impression that we get because our systems fail us and make us feel like there isn't enough to go around and that we're competing for resources and all these things when truly it is an inequitable way of distributing resources. And I agree, like the, the reason like now is the time now is when we're able to act, like make those shifts happen and that work is truly happening before our, our eyes and the fact that it can happen and is happening during a pandemic I think makes me a little more hopeful and and yeah some of those changes we can see it now we can we're seeing people come together and fix the systems that do not serve us and a lot of them in my opinion as well are we're not well, this is probably not even an opinion, but they were not built to serve us all or not built to serve us fairly. So should they even exist, we do need to reimagine the way that they function and who they're helping and how they're helping and who is at the top figuring this stuff out, who is structuring these, all those things I think are things that people are thinking about now and moving towards now. So I, I am definitely hopeful. And I think that change is happening. And yeah, like like Cyrus said, it's just I think now is the time to act. This is a we, to take advantage of this opportunity. This is like a pivotal moment. I I do I think I mean that both of what what I'm hearing from Cyrus and Safia really resonate with me. I feel a true, deep, and a buoyant sense of hope. Um, and a lot of it's coming from the creation of things uh, during a time of the pandemic. So like we always had the gardens, but there's something about getting in them right now and, and getting to look at uh, what's past and what's about to become. Now that we're seeing this new light in the mornings, you've seen just in the last week or so, there's a new type of light and that's because it's the signal of spring. So that light's gonna keep coming and that light's a signal of hope as well. It's not that the winter doesn't bring hope. It's just that it's going to give us more access to being outdoors and getting on the land. And uh, Paula, I really appreciate uh, what you just shared with us because I do, I want to say, I mean, it's a difficult thing to be uh, vulnerable for many of us at times. And uh, just this morning, I was thinking about this writer, Richard Wagamez, who, who wrote in a book, One Native Life, something I'm reading right now. And he shares with us some of the most painful memories that I, you know, it, it made me weep thinking about him and thinking about all of the indigenous children, all children who are left at the mercy of adults who are not caring and not providing the care that they need. And, and it's that kind of suffering, knowing about the suffering that's out there that's uh, sometimes feels absolutely unbearable. And so I really appreciate you sharing that with us and how can we deal with that suffering and that sense of guilt that I, that I made it, that I made it through here. I made it past the trauma. I've done a, quite a bit of healing. I, I wanna recommend or advise some of the things I do, which is going, literally going to the land. Anytime you can be walking outside and going down to the water, 
We have this incredible relationship with the water. If we can see water being near it, or even pour water on us in the day, if we can't access a body of water, pour water on yourself with throughout the day, onto your arms, onto your hands, drink water. Have that experience with the land in any shape you can. I talked a little bit uh, earlier, maybe about the loved ones that have gone before us, because that are, those are our ancestors. Get a candle if you can't create a fire, which I'm lucky I can create, I have a little dish and I can create fire in it in the backyard in our garden. But you get a candle and have that sense of oneness with yourself and praying. Uh, some people feel uncomfortable about praying. I'm gonna say meditating. Um, create that relationship with your loved ones who are in the past, who may have gone on to the spirit world. They're just behind the veil. They are right here with us. And as you create that relationship, they will literally come to visit you in your dreams to assure you that everything's okay. You will feel that sense of hope in your life. Believe it, uh, uh, meditate with it and experience it because that is the healing we're all looking for in our journey in this lifetime. And, and collectively as we do that, things will get better. Those system changes really will happen. And ultimately I believe the environment will make it change for the things that we have not done and the things that we have done, the environment is going to make these changes take place and we just have to be ready for it. So I think uh, Cyrus, your play is really something profound to see and see that um, this is actually a teaching that they've been sharing. A lot of the visionaries have talked about the actual waterways are going to engulf a great part of the planet. And uh, our ancestors have been talking about that for a number of decades. And that time we see uh, those signals coming so this is the time of rebirth. Sounds terrifying, but we're, the planet is rebirthing. And we have a role in prayer and meditating and self-healing to help Mother Earth rebirth. And um, I'm, I'm doing all that I can to learn about that in my own life and share that with others and find that sense of peace. I need just a little piece of that peace to keep my well-being going well and going forward. Thank you very much for that. You know, I, I agree with Shafia. These are very hopeful responses and you all are shining the light on what it is to do the work, but also do the work from a place of hope. And I have to say that I have read some of the works that you have online and you all are very in line with the concept of hope, you know, and how we are doing, why we do this revolution, why it is important to work towards li liberation rather than just equity, you know, like all these aspects that we have uh, in common in this work that we do in community organizing and activism. And one thing that is fascinating for me is the fact that all the aspects that you touch on resonate with me as, you know, in, in, my, in my skin, I, have, I can feel connected to each one of you through the words that you are, you are sharing today. So I am extremely grateful for that. I wanted to touch on uh, a very important aspect that, that uh, you had also make reference to, you know, the fact that we are dealing with a public health crisis, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemia. That means, um, and I, you realize I use the word in Spanish, pandemia. So <laughs> that means I'm very excited about the conversation. So um, we are going through this uh, a pandemia together. And, but the realities of each one of us are, are different based on our identities and the access to resources and our locations. Again, the intersectionality of our identities play a very big role. But I want to talk about what happens to artists, you know, and, and how uh, entire communities have come to artists for, you know, support to create the art that was going to hold the community that is going to bring hope, inspire, et cetera, et cetera. So how much are we pushing ourselves and, and are taking um, work when we also need to take care of ourselves? So how we do that and how we come to terms with this sense of we want to do it because it's the thing that we need to do, but also be aware of how our bodies and our minds talk to us and what we need as, as human beings individually. Whoever would like to respond on that. Um, yeah, I can start with that. I, um, in 2019, I think I was 
a really pivotal year for me and I completely overextended myself and pushed myself way too far. And in 2020, I was moving with the intention of kind of taking a step back, slowing down, figuring out what projects I should take and which I shouldn't and what kind of work I should be doing. And um, I said that out loud, but making a declaration doesn't make it so you can't you have to do the things take the steps to get there and i was inching towards that it's definitely a process to figure out how do i take care of myself now after i've reached the point where i went too far and i completely burnt myself out um, how do i recover from that how do i make sure this doesn't happen again and i was making gradual steps in terms of thinking about how many projects I should take on, how much work I should be doing. Um, but truly it took the pandemic, if I'm being completely honest, I wish it was all me, but it took the world stopping for me to actually stop. And for me to, because my hand was forced, basically, I, everything was shutting down that I wasn't able to finish the workshop I was doing or plan for some of the other projects in the year. So I had to stop and kind of reevaluate. And that is one of the biggest blessings I could have had in my life is having that time to look inward and figure out how different things are serving me and how I should orient myself moving forward. And, um, just to even be able to spend time with my family instead of working while I'm at work, working outside of work, working when I'm visiting my family, even that just to experience joy with the people that you love and just be in conversation without thinking about the 12 things you have to do. All of that was really healing for me. And I'm truly not the type of person that can, you know, take a nice bath and paint my nails. And that like, to me, that does not do much in terms of self self care, but being, being a little more silent, being more still, just being present really does help soothe me. And I think just giving myself 2020 to take it very easy and just figure things out and just heal, that has put me in a better position to move forward now in 2021. And when we do come out of this, I'll have a better sense of how, what my limits are and how do I move forward. So truly it was, I, I was in a very fortunate position where I was working full time and doing projects on the side. And I was very fortunate to be able to have that security through the pandemic. And that is not the case for everyone. So I was very fortunate to be afforded that opportunity to have that time to really reflect inward. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, um, I don't know. I think I think a lot of a lot of us struggle with uh, asking for help when we need it, and sometimes we don't even know we need it. And sometimes it does take something so astronomical like a pandemic. And I think I really relate to what you just shared with us. Um, we had eight uh, ongoing community projects that were birthed out of Niche Dish while running a catering business and. A restaurant, uh, which was hard enough. I haven't really had the opportunity to share how difficult it is to actually get indigenous food products. So uh, running this restaurant isn't like running any other restaurant or cafe. They, they can't go order the food. There's certain amounts of food that could come in that, that we could order and have it brought in, but the key components of the food that is on our very menu, we would have to drive. I had to drive and uh, other staff had to drive um, three hours to get one ingredient, and that's the white corn. It only exists in one place. So it's a very stressful business, even though it's my life's dream of trying to bring back our foods and, and make them available and accessible to um, our community here. Uh, wild rice, for example, which is, this was all wild rice territory. Wild rice was all over the place here in the one dish, one spoon territory. Um, that's how the Anishinaabe people got here. We were actually brought to the source of wild rice and we followed those wild rice patterns uh, through Nana Bojo, our spirit guide and, and mentor. And uh, the wild rice patterns came through the Finger Lakes, which are the Great Lakes. And they brought us here through many thousands of years of migration from the East Coast, um, as told to us in the story. So the story talks all about it. I'd love it if anyone's interested to get a hold of this book, the Mishomis book, which is written by the late Edward Benton Benai, who just passed away during the pandemic, and uh, Chimigwech Ed Edward for this book. But 
it's during these times for myself where I look at finding joy. So all of us have talked about that today. And I think that's the key component. It's the smallest things that we have to look to that sometimes we're taking for granted. And then all of a sudden you see it just sitting, like Chefe, you were saying, just sitting still and being quiet. That's really hard for me to do. I feel like I'm constantly being called to something and rather than saying no I can't do that I'll get engaged too long before I can actually say I'm actually not able to do this thing even though I'm so excited about it so just having that cup of tea and looking at this plant looking at the things I need many of them antivirals just want to share that if you have access to getting antivirals which are like lemon balm uh, hyssop is one of them um, another favorite of mine is elderberry. These really help build the immune system. Don't wait till you're feeling unwell or feeling sad or feeling lonely. Look at these plants and think about what your relationship is to them. Access them. There are many herb stores uh, in the city, or you can find uh, local gardeners who do provide them for the community at times. So um, making time for yourself, I guess that's what I'm saying, is looking for the things that bring you joy and looking at them each day and saying, that's it. This is the thing that I love. I love to smudge and I do that act for myself. And uh, I love to have those teas. So I have to take the time to make them and they take a lot of time to make them, but I do it. And um, it's just so important that I acknowledge that I need help and I need to ask those around me for help. Currently suffering with uh, thoracic outlet syndrome and it's, it's really painful and I need help. I ask my partner to help do the stretches I need to do. And I, I go to physio, not all of us can get to physio, um, but I look online for ways to stretch and I have a mat. And these are the things I'm trying to do during this time to really support the things that I need. And that means not being in a chair all the time in, in front of the Zoom, which we are all doing that a lot. And we all have to take time to step back and and uh, find those key things that, that are going to keep us healthy at this time. And those are some of the things that, that I do. I think uh, prayer, uh, intake of food, but acknowledging what you're eating, like really understanding what that, what that thing is. Sometimes you just want to grab the thing that's fast, but creating that food. We made elk woodland pie last night, and it's really delicious. I recognize that most people don't have access to elk. I do. I make a spirit plate and bring it to the land for my ancestors because I have a little bit of elk right now and it's so important to me and I'm so happy that I have it. Chi miigwech. Um yeah, I really just re was resonating with what you what you both were saying and I think that this year has been this year of learning how to take care of each other. Um, and everybody has sort of been saying, you know, we take care of us or we take care of each other. And uh, we're recognizing that we can't rely on the state to take care of us. We are recognizing that we uh, are responsible to each other. We're interdependent, which we learned from disability justice movements, you know. And so, you know, for me, this year has been about in a, in a big picture kind of way, trying to figure out how we were, how we're going to take care of each other uh, going forward, um, you know. Uh, so, yeah, you know. Then, you know, the personal is political, <laughs> right? So, you know, I've had to also think through. Okay, well, then, what does that mean for me to take care of myself? What does it mean mm -hmm. for me to take care of my family, my community? Um, you know, I was, I'm an artist. So, in the beginning of the pandemic, everything was canceled. Everything was canceled. So I found myself, you know, with unlimited amounts of time for the first time in, in a very recent, you know, history. So it, in a very long history. So I, um, you know, and I found it challenging. I found it challenging to figure out how to spend the time and, and you know, I'm used to being busy and, you know, it, but really actually I'm so thankful that I had had months where I really didn't do very much because you know, the revolution kind of kicked off in June after all of those police killings, and we've just been running ever since, it feels like, you know, um, fighting for Black lives, fighting for Indigenous lives, they keep killing us, you know, so we're, we're doing all of this work to try to stop the, this violence and to try to defund the police and abolish the police and, and do this work, and so it's felt like a marathon, really, since June. Um, right now, of course, it's February, it's Black History Month, it's the one time of the year 
when these organizations remember that there are Black people, uh, that there are Black artists, that there are Black scientists, that there are Black journalists, that there are Black whatever. So all of us are just run ragged in February because, it, you know, you get busy. That's when you get busy, you know? And I think a lot of communities can relate to this, whether it's, you know, other, other you know, months that are dedicated to particular communities where that's the month that you get really, really busy. So, you know, everybody is saying, you know, there are 11 other months, you know, you could incorporate Black programming all, all year round and that would make it more sustainable for all of us. Um, so anyways, I'm just sort of thinking through what, what does it mean right now to be as busy as I am with activism that there's no end in sight because we're in this revolutionary moment, but also needing to sort of care. And what I'm really looking forward to is spring because for me, spring brings about one of my favorite pastimes, which is gardening, which is touching the earth, which is being on the land, which is, you know, even in my apartment here where I have a balcony and I just have little container gardens, you know, but I, I grow food that I eat, you know, I grow kale, I grow tomatoes, I grow, I, I grow food and I, I, I feed my family with the food that I grow and I, and I take care of these living beings and we're in relation to each other, you know? Um, and that is really healing for my mental health. That's really healing for my spirit, you know? So I'm looking forward to, thank you, Joel, for saying the light is changing, you know? It's like, yes, spring is coming um, and it's about to look really different. You know, I'm looking forward to those warm summer nights sitting out on the balcony and just sort of seeing that sky you know, that expansive summer sky that you see, you know, and that is gonna, that, you know, that will heal me too. So anyways, we, we, um, we find these moments of joy as we, as we fight. Yeah, as we fight for change. What a gift, what a gift to hear you all, to hear your wisdom and your wise practices. They are really a gift and a blessing to all of us who are listening and learning and unlearning through all this process. I am, I feel absolutely grateful for, for having the opportunity to hearing you this closely and with this much attention that my whole body is, is going into. I also recognize that there is a lot of uh, emotional labor that comes through, you know, having these conversations that are transparent and honest and that discuss uh, personal and very intimate, if you will, uh, relationships that we have with ourselves. So I am in so much gratitude that you you three have created the space in this conversation for, for not only for me, but everybody else that is connected here to reflect, to enter in a, in a conversation with uh, ourselves into what it means to take care of ourselves, but what it means to take care of each other. I, I would like to invite you to, to share with us, you know, your last thoughts on, on, on this intersection of uh, art, activism, and mental health, and especially focusing on your projects. You know, I know that uh, right now Cyrus is also working on on a, a fundraising initiative to support uh, Black communities to the Black Lives Matter Fund. So let's let's talk about some of those initiatives as well because we need to also move from from performative allyship. You know, we have all you know all month of February as as, as Cyrus was making reference to. Um, Everybody is understanding Black History Month, but there is another 11 months of the year. So how about if we also uh, work towards uh, being true allies in what that means, you know, recognizing that there are places in which we are in positions of privilege and there are places where we are the vulnerable ones. So how we work this and how we create a space, a spaces of true allyship, where we give the spotlight and the visibility to the realities of our brothers and sisters in our communities. So I will just give the space for those final thoughts before we end this conversation, recognizing that there is emotional and physical labor going through these processes that take us to a deep place on ourselves. And I, again, in very much gratitude with each one of you. Thank you so much, Paula. I, I would just mention, yes, we have uh, through Black Lives Matter Canada, 
uh, we've launched a Black Mutual Aid Fund, which has already raised uh, almost $300,000 to give money out directly to the community through micro grants. So it goes directly back into the community. We're trying to raise 500,000 so that we can reach about 2,000 people across this North part of Turtle Island and Inuit Inuit to get funds uh, to support them in these really challenging times. So if you're somebody who uh, can donate, uh, we encourage you to check out the Black Mutual Aid Fund. If you're somebody who's looking for support, we encourage you to apply to the Black Mutual Aid Fund because um, that's what it's there for. Um, um, so that's definitely something that, uh, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, you know, I would just say, uh, you know, I want to shout out the tiny uh, shelter, tiny house shelters that that man Matthew or Michael has been building in, in Toronto that the has been targeted by the city, you know, building these shelters for folks who are living without housing. And, and I just read this beautiful article of folks saying what the impact of having this housing has been, uh, that the city's trying to, you know, clear away and they're trying to sue him. And, you know, we need to support folks who are practicing mutual aid in this way, you know, and, and I really want to shout that shout out that tiny shelter project. And then lastly, just to give so much support and love to Landback, 1492 Landback Lane, and what is happening out there, you know, as they're continuing to bulldoze and they're continuing to try to push forth, you know, the this construction process, um, you know, despite the dispute and, uh, you know, supporting uh, Landback uh, Lane, but also supporting Landback movements uh, from uh, Mi'kma'ki to Wet'suwet'en to um, here in Toronto. So, um, yeah, I just think there's a lot of work to, to be done and, 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 and now's the time to do it. Thanks. Oh, um, I, I, is it possible for me to share my screen just for um, one picture that's got the gardens and some of the artwork that really is a homage to one of our great uh, elders, Pauline, Pauline Shirt, who had a dream and had a commitment to creating the first Indigenous school in Canada, which she did, called Wandering Spirits. Uh, the TDSB now hosts it, it, is at 16 Finn Avenue. And if I can share this, you'll see the mural that we did for Grandma Pauline in front of those four, uh, four little gardens that uh, that are at um, the Bickford Center. And that is the mural. And I'm not sure if anyone's sharing the photo. Okay, well. It's yes, so yes, beautiful. Yeah. Can you yes. see it? Okay, great. So that's... Um, that creature you see behind Grandma Pauline is called uh, uh, Mishu Pishu. And it has this uh, incredible relationship with protecting the water. And it has sort of this fighting kind of relationship with the Thunderbird. And the Thunderbirds, of course, in our world are a most glorious being that bring all the rains to Mother Earth. And so we need the Thunderbirds. And then this creature, Mishu Pishu, which is the great underwater lynx or underwater panther, it protects the Great Lakes. It lives under there. It's an actual being, just like the Thunderbirds are actual beings. And uh, Grandma is on a sema leaf. You can't quite see it there in front of it. And she's doing the water ceremony because it's one of her responsibilities. It's all of our responsibility, but she shares that ceremony with us. So uh, Pauline, uh, who lives here still to this day and has been practicing here for some 50 years and is a great uh, well-known elder. She's the elder at George Brown as well and for the TDSB. She has brought us many gifts, myself personally, and I want to uh, uh, thank my grandma and thank all the grandmas of Toronto and of all nations for giving back to all of their grandchildren and all of their children and uh, for giving us this sense of hope that we talk about today. Chi miigwech. Wow, that was such a beautiful mural. I can't wait to see it in person one day. That's stunning. Um, I just, I just to reiterate what some, uh, everyone else had mentioned as well about um, 
how the whole relationship with activism uh, and art and mental health that that is currently happening like as we've seen with um, with Cyrus and Joel and people in the city who may not be artists but are working right now to make those changes happen and are activists in their own way and actually doing things that are bettering the lives of so many people like the, these things are happening before our lives and or our eyes and it's so important to support them in any way that is available to us and yeah just I, I it's just really nice to see that everyone is doing their part right now and everyone is is trying and trying to bridge that gap and it's just really nice to see that work being done by so many people um, in the arts and outside and yeah just to watch that happen is a really beautiful thing and kind of how Cyrus had mentioned earlier about the personal being political that is so much more true now that I can see that now I don't know if that comes with age or if that is an actual shift that's happening but um, like the existence of people and their identity and claiming space and uh, the work that's being done to support all the communities that need it all of all of that is like activism and mental health and healing for people um and yeah it's just so beautiful to see that all happen and yeah i'm just very happy to see like the, these shifts happening right now thank you each one of you for being part of this conversation as i had said before what a blessing what an honor and what a conversation that lift up spirits. It's definitely one of those conversations that we need to have and in, in, in have daily in our lives. So these are the type of conversations that I could stay in a screen for a number of hours. But again, I recognize that we all not only have busy lives, but that it, there is also emotional labor that goes into this. With very much gratitude, I am uh, concluding this, this um, panel, this conversation, hoping that we create and continue creating those spaces that allow us to dream for a different world, for a world where we all can exist, coexist, have our needs met, and also reach our potentials, being able to be free and reach that liberation in all the aspects of our lives. So I thank you all for being present here and for allowing us to be part of, of your lives today and, and feel this important connection. I want to share with you that Street Art Toronto has also par partnered with, with a educator, Rebecca Higgins, and they are having a series of uh, workshops online as well. Please check in. Uh, street art website for those workshops. There is a workshop uh, tomorrow, taking place tomorrow, and it's at 10.30 a.m. So please check that because it's also on the topic of uh, mental health and wellness. As well as Muse Arts, we are doing our holistic wellness artist talks, and you are most welcome to join those conversations as well. We need to have conversations about mental health constantly, consistently, and make this conversation, not a conversation that only happens in January as a part of a campaign, but rather a conversation that's part of our lives every single day. Thanks again, and we hope to see you soon.